Hello and welcome back. If you've uh, continued this far, you've made it all the way to chapter 73 of the dramatic reading of Stephen King's The Eyes of the Dragon. And we continue on. Chapter 73, as I said. Peter at first entertained giddy thoughts of promising Besson another bribe to take the locket and the crumbling sheet of fool scap to Anders Pena. Uh, recall that he found in a secret passage in his uh, jail cell a locket and a note from somebody else who had been framed by flag 450 years ago. In his initial flush of excitement, it seemed to him that his note must point the finger of guilt at Flagg and set him free. A little reflection convinced him that while this might happen in a storybook, it would not happen in real life. Pena would laugh and call it a forgery. And if he took it seriously, that might mean the end of, the end of both the Judge General and the imprisoned prince. Peter's ears were sharp, and he listened closely to the gossip of the mead houses and the wine shops as it passed back and forth between Beeson and the uh, Besson, rather, and the lesser warders. He had heard the farmer's tax increase. He had heard the bitter joke which suggested that Thomas the Lightbringer should be renamed Thomas the Taxbringer. He had even heard that some few daring wags had renamed his brother Foggy Tom the Constantly Bombed. The headsman's axe had swung with regularity of a clock's pendulum since Thomas had ascended Delane's throne. Only this clock called out, Treason, sedition, treason, sedition, with a regularity that would have been monotonous had it not been so frightening. But by now, Peter had begun to su suspect Flagg's goal, to bring the ordered monarchy of Delane to an utter smash. Showing the locket of the note would only get him laughed at or cause Pena to take some sort of action. And that would undoubtedly get them both killed. In the end, Peter put the locket and Foolscap back where they'd come from. And with them, he put the three-foot pigtail that had taken him a month to weave. On the whole, he did not feel too bitter about the evening's work. The rope had held and the finding of the locket in Foolscap, after more than 400 years, proved at least one thing. The hiding place was not apt to be discovered. It's a good point. Hasn't turned up in four centuries. Still, he had much food for thought, and he lay awake long that night. When he slept, he seemed to hear Levin Valera's dry, stony voice whispering in one ear, Avenge! 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 Chapter 74 Time. Yes, time. Peter spent a great deal of time at the top of the needle. His beard grew long, save for where that white scar streaked his cheek like a lightning bolt. So he saw so many changes from his window as it grew. He heard, more, he heard of more terrible changes yet. The headsman's pendulum had not slowed down, but actually sped, speeded up. Treason, sedition, treason, sedition, it sang. Sometimes half a dozen heads rolled in the course of but a single day. During Peter's third year of imprisonment, the year in which Peter was first able to do 30 chin-ups in a single effort from his bedchamber's central beam, Pena resigned his post as Judge General in disgust. It was the talk of the mead houses and wine shops for a week, and the talk of Peter's keepers for a week and a day. The warders believed that Flagg would have Pena jailed almost before the heat of the old man's bum had left the judge's bench, and that soon after the citizens of Delane would find out once and for all if there was blood or ice water in the judge general's veins. But when Pena remained free, the talk died down. Peter was glad Pena had not been arrested. He bore him no ill will, in spite of Pena's willingness to believe that he had murdered his father, and he knew that the arrangement of evidence had been Flag's doing. Also during Peter's third year in the needle, Delane's good old da, oh, Dennis's good old da Brandon died. His passing was simple but dignified. He had finished his day's work, in spite of a terrible pain in his chest, and sighed, and came slowly home. He sat down 
in the little living room, hoping the pain would pass. Instead, it grew worse. He called his wife and son to his side, kissed them both, and asked, that he might, asked if he might have a glass of bundle gin. This was provided. He drank it off, kissed his wife again, and then sent her from the room. "'You must serve your master that well now, Dennis,' he said. "'You're a man now, with a man's task set before you.'" <laughs> I don't know what that accent was. I'm so Thanks for humoring me. I'll serve, the "'I'll serve the king as well as I may, da,' Dennis said, although the thought of taking over his father's responsibilities terrified him. His good, homely face was shiny with tears. For the last three years, Brandon and Dennis had buttled for, Den for Thomas." And Dennis's responsibilities had been much the same as before with Peter. But it had never been the same somehow. Not even close to the same. Thomas, I, Brandon said and then whispered. But if the time comes to do your ma first master a service, Dennis, you mustn't hesitate. I have never... At that moment, Brandon clutched the left side of his chest, stiffened, and died. He died where he would have wanted to die, in his own chair, in front of his own fire. That's a good point. What more could any of us ask? In Peter's fourth year of imprisonment, his rope below the stones grew, growing steadily longer and longer, the Stodd family disappeared. The throne possessed itself of what little there remained of their lands, as it had done when other noble families disappeared, and as Thomas's reign progressed, there were more and more disappearances. The Stods were only one item of Mead House gossip in a busy week that included four beheadings, an increased levy against shopkeepers, and the imprisonment of an old woman who had for three days walked back and forth in front of the palace, screaming that her grandson had been taken and tortured for speaking against the previous year's cattle levies. But when Peter heard the Stodd name in the warder's conversation, his heart had stopped for a moment. The chain of events leading to the disappearance of the Stodds was one familiar to everyone in Delane by now. The tick-tocking pendulum of the headsman's axe had thinned the numbers of the nobility terribly. Many of these nobles died because, of their, fam because their families had served the kingdom for hundreds or thousands of years, and they could not believe such an unjust fate would or could fall on them. Others, seeing bloody handwriting on the wall, fled. The Stods were among these. And the whispering began. Tales were told behind cupped hands, tales suggesting that these nobles had not simply scattered to the four winds, but had gathered together somewhere, perhaps in the deep woods at the northern end of the kingdom, to plan an overthrow of the throne. These stories passed to Peter like the wind through his window, the drafts beneath his door. They were dreams of a wider world. Mostly he worked on his rope. During the first year, the rope grew longer by 18 inches every three weeks. At the end of that year, he had a slim cable that was 25 feet long. A cable that was, theoretically at least, strong enough to bear his weight. But there was a difference between dangling from a beam in his bedroom and dangling above a drop of 300 feet. And Peter knew it. He was, quite literally, staking his life on that slim cord. And 25 feet a year was perhaps not enough. It could take more than eight years before he could even try. And the rumblings he heard at second hand had grown loud enough to be disturbing. Above all else, the kingdom must endure. There must be no revolt, no chaos. Wrongs must be put right. But by law, not by bows and slings and maces and clubs. Thomas, Levin Valera, Roland, he himself, even Flag, paled in insignificance next to that. There must be law. How Anders Pena, growing old and bitter by his fire, would have loved him for that. Peter determined that he must make his effort to escape as soon as possible. Accordingly, he made long calculations, doing the figures in his head so as to leave no trace. He did them again and again 
and again, proving to himself that he had made no mistake. In his second year in the needle, he began to pluck ten threads from each napkin. In his third year, fifteen. In his fourth year, twenty. The rope grew. Fifty-eight feet long after the second year, a hundred and four after the third, a hundred and sixty after the fourth. The rope at that time would still have fetched up a hundred and forty feet from the ground. It's just how tall, far away from the ground he is, uh, the tall, tall this tower is. What patience and dedication. During his last year, Peter began to take 30 threads from each napkin, and for the first time his robberies showed clearly. Each napkin looked frayed on all four sides, as if the mice had been at it. Peter waited in agony for his thefts to be discovered. Shall we go on? All right. You folks have really stuck it out. You deserve to get closer to the end here. Chapter 75. But they were not discovered then or ever. There was not so much as a question ever raised. Peter had spent endless nights, or so they seemed to him, wondering and worrying when Flag would hear some wrong thing or some wrong note and get some wind of what he was up to. He would send some underling, Peter supposed, with the questions, and the questions would begin. Peter had thought things out with agonizing care, and he had made only one wrong assumption. But that one led to a second, as wrong assumptions often do. Ooh, little lesson there. And that, and that second was a dilly. He had assumed that there was some finite number of napkins, perhaps a thousand or so in all, and that they were being used over and over again. His thinking on the subject of the napkin supply never went much further than that. Dennis could have told him differently and saved him perhaps two years of work, but Dennis was never asked. The truth was simple but staggering. Peter's nap napkins were not coming from a supply of a thousand, or two thousand, or twenty thousand. They were nearly half a million of these old, musty napkins in all. Half a million? Two hundred and fifty thousand napkins on one of the deep levels below the castle was a storeroom as big as a ballroom it was filled with napkins napkins nothing but napkins they smelled musty to peter and that wasn't surprising most of them coincidentally or not dated from a time not long after the imprisonment and death of levin valera and the existence of all those napkins, coincidentally or not, was, indirectly at least, the work of Flag. In a queer sort of way, he had created them. Those had been dark times indeed in Delane. The chaos Flag so earnestly wished had almost come upon the land. Valera had been removed. Mad King Alan had ascended the throne in his place. If he had lived another ten years, the kingdom surely would have drowned in blood. But Alan was struck down by lightning while playing cubits on the back lawn in the pouring rain one day. As I told you, was, he was mad. It was lightning, some said, sent by the gods themselves. He was followed by his niece, Kyla, who became known as Kyla the Good. And from Kyla, the line of succession had run straight and true down through the generations to Roland and the brothers to whose tale you've been listening. Very diligently, I may add. Good on you. It was Kyla the Good Queen who had brought the land out of its darkness and poverty. She had nearly bankrupted the royal treasury to do it, but she knew that currency, hard currency, is the lifeblood of a kingdom. Much of Delane's hard currency had been drained away during the wild, weird reign of Alan the Second a king who sometimes drunk blood from the notched ears of his servants and who had insisted that he could fly. A king more interested in magic and necromancy than profit and loss and the welfare of his people. Kyla knew it and would take a massive flow of both love and gilders to set the wrongs of Alan's reign right. 
and she began by trying to put every able-bodied person in Delane back to work, from eldest to youngest. Many of the older citizens of the castle keep had been set to making napkins. Not because napkins were needed. I think I've already told you how most of Delane's royalty and nobility felt about them. Remember, they didn't really use them. But because work was needed. These were hands that had been idle for 20 years or more in some cases, and they worked with a will, weaving on looms exactly like the one in Sasha's dollhouse, except in the matter of size, of course. For ten years, these people, over a thousand of them, made napkins and drew hard coin from Kyla's treasury for their work. For ten years, people only slightly younger and a little more able to get about had taken them down to the cool, dry store. Oh, sorry. So for ten years, people only slightly younger and a little more able to get about had taken them down to the cool, dry storeroom below the castle. Peter had noticed that some of the napkins brought to him were moth-eaten as well as musty-smelling. The wonder, although he didn't know it, was that so many of them were still in such fine condition. Dennis could have told him that the napkins were brought, used once, removed, minus the few threads Peter plucked from each, and then simply thrown away. After all, why not? There were enough of them, all told, to last 500 princes 500 years, and longer. If Andrus Pena had not been a merciful man as well as a hard one, there really might have been a finite number of napkins. But he knew how badly that nameless woman in the rocking chair needed the work and the pittance it brought in. Kyla the Good had known the same in her time. And so he kept her on, as he continued to see that Besson's guilders went on flowing after the Stods were forced to flee. He became a fixture, oh, she became a fixture outside the room of napkins. That old woman with her needle for unmaking rather than making, because she took the royal crest off them, because they all had that. There she sat in her rocker, year after year, removing tens of thousands of royal crests. And so it was really not surprising that no word of Peter's petty thievery ever reached Flag's ears. So you see that except for that one mistaken assumption and that one unasked question, Peter could have gotten about his work much faster. It did sometimes seem to him that the napkins were not shrinking as rapidly as they ought to have, but it never occurred to him to question his basic, if vague, idea that the napkins he used were being regularly returned to him. If he had asked himself that one simple question, but perhaps in the end all things worked out for the best, or perhaps not, that's another thing. You must decide for yourself. This is going well. I can't leave you with a napkin story. I think we got to keep going to chapter 76. Let's get some spice in here before we end our night. 76. Eventually, Dennis got over his fright of being Thomas's butler. After all, Thomas ignored him almost completely, except to sometimes berate him for forgetting to put out his shoes. Usually Thomas himself had left his shoes somewhere else, then had forgotten where or to insist Dennis have a glass of wine with him. The wine always made Dennis feel sick to his stomach, although he had come to enjoy a wee drop of bundle gin in the evenings. He drank it nonetheless. He did not need his good old da around to tell him that one did not refuse to drink with the king when asked, and sometimes, usually, when he was drunk, Thomas would forbid Dennis to go home, but insist that he spend the night in Thomas's apartments instead. Dennis supposed, and rightly, that these, that these were nights on which Thomas simply felt too lonely to bear his own solitary company. He would give long, besotted, rambling sermons on how difficult it was to be king, how he was trying to do the best job he could and be fair, and how everyone hated him for some reason or other just the same. Thomas often wept during these sermons, or laughed wildly, but nothing. But usually he just fell asleep halfway through some mangled defense of one tax or another. Sorry. Sometimes he staggered off to his bed and Dennis would sleep on the couch. Oftentimes, Thomas, Thomas fell asleep or passed out on the couch and Dennis made his uncomfortable bed on the cooling hearth. <laughs> 
It was perhaps the strangest existence any king's butler had ever known. But of course, it seemed normal enough to Dennis because it was all he had ever known. Thomas mostly ignoring him was one thing. Flag ignoring him was another, even more important thing. Flag had, in fact, entirely dismissed Dennis's part in his scheme to send Peter to the needle. Dennis had been no more than a tool to him, a tool which had served its purpose and could be put aside. If he had thought of Dennis, it would have seemed to him that the tool had been well rewarded. Dennis was the king's butler, after all. But on an early winter's night, in the year when Peter was twenty-one and Thomas sixteen, a night when Peter's thin rope was finally nearing completion, Dennis saw something which changed everything. And it was with the thing Dennis saw. Wait, and it what and it is this, and it and it is excuse me. Sorry, I have to have to sometimes record these things late at night. I'm tired, it's been a long day at work with the kids and everything. I hope it's worth it, right? Uh and it is with the thing Dennis saw that cold night that I must begin to narrate the final events of my tale. I feel like I butchered that ending. Uh, I feel like I can do this justice. I'm going to keep going on to chapter 77. If you'll indulge me, we're entering the final phase. Let's do one more chapter and then I'll let you go. 77. It was a night much like those during the terrible time just before and after Roland's death. The wind shrieked out of a black sky and moaned in the alleys of Delane. Frost lay thick in the pastures of the inner baronies and on the cobbles of the castle city. At first, at, th- uh, wait. at first, a three-quarters moon chased in and out of the rushing clouds, but by midnight the clouds had thickened enough to obscure the moon completely. And by two in the morning, when Thomas awoke, Dennis, by rattling the latch of the door between his sitting room and the corridor outside, it had begun to snow. Dennis heard the rattling and sat up, grimacing at the stiffness in his back and the pins and needles in his legs. Oh, I remember this part now. This is going to be good. Tonight, Thomas had fallen asleep on the couch instead of lurching his way to bed, so it had been the hearth for the young butler. Now the fire was almost out. The side of him which had been lying closer to it felt baked. The other side of it felt frozen. He looked for, he looked toward the rattling sound, and for a moment terror froze his heart and vitals. For that one moment, he thought there was there, he, he thought that there was a ghost at the door, and he almost screamed. Then he saw it was only Thomas, in his white nightshirt. My, my Lord King. Thomas took no notice. His eyes were open but they were not looking at the latch. They were wide and dreaming, and they looked straight ahead at nothing. Dennis suddenly guessed that the young king was sleepwalking. Even as Dennis decided this, Thomas seemed to realize that the reason the latch wouldn't work was that the bolt was still on. He drew it and then passed out into the hall, looking more ghost-like than ever in the guttering light of the corridor sconces. There was a swirl of nightshirt hem, and then he was gone, on bare feet. Dennis sat stock still at the hearth for a moment, cross-legged, his pins and needles forgotten, his heart thumping. Outside, the wind hurled snow against the diamond-shaped panes of the sitting-room window and uttered a long banshee howl. <sighs> what should he do? There was only one thing, of course. The young king was his master. He must follow. Perhaps it was the wild night which had brought Roland so vividly to Thomas's mind, but not necessarily. In fact, Thomas thought of his father a great deal. Guilt is like a sore, endlessly fascinating, and the guilty party feels compelled to examine it and pick at it so that it never really heals. Thomas had drunk far less than usual, but strangely, he seemed drunker than ever to Dennis. His sentences had been broken and garbled, his eyes wide and staring, showing too much of the whites. This was, to a large extent, because Flag was gone. There had been rumors that the renegade nobility, Stads among them, had been seen gathered together in the far forests of the northern reaches of the kingdom 
Flag had led a regiment of tough, battle-hardened soldiers in search of them. Thomas was always more skittish when Flag was gone. He knew it was because he had come to depend completely on the Dark Magician. But he had come to depend on Flag in ways he did not fully understand. Too much wine was no longer Thomas's only vice. Sleep is often denied to those with secrets, and Thomas was afflicted with severe insomnia. Without knowing it, he had become addicted to Flag's sleeping potions. Flag had left a supply of the drug with Thomas when he led the soldiers north, but Flag had expected to be gone only three days, four at the most. For the last three days, Thomas had slept badly, or not at all. He felt strange, never quite awake, never quite asleep. Thoughts of his father haunted him. He seemed to hear his father's voice in the wind, crying out, Why do you stare at me? Why do you stare at me so? Visions of wine. Visions of Flag's darkly cheerful face. Visions of his father's hair catching fire. These things drove sleep away and left him wide-eyed in the long watches of the night while the rest of the castle slept. When Flag had still not returned on the eighth night, and he and his soldiers were even then camped fifty miles from the castle and Flag was in a foul mood, the only trace of the nobles they found had been frozen hoof prints that might have been days or weeks old. Thomas sent for Dennis. It was later that night, that eighth night, that Thomas arose from his couch and began to walk. And we will close there. Hopefully you enjoyed that. We are really getting into the thick of it now. Look at how far through the book we have gotten, folks. Are you proud of yourselves? Stay tuned. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Appreciate the comments, the support, the feedback, anything I can do to improve the delivery, voices, whatever. I'm recording this stuff for my kids. Uh, and for the young at heart, for your kids, hope you enjoy it. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.